Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. The No Central Library Seminar provides an ed educational forum for the presentation of ideas, research updates, and news in support of NOAA's mission. I'm Katie. Please note this presentation is being recorded and your name, email, and questions will be shared with the presenter after the fact. As an attendee, you are muted, so please place all questions in the question panel. Questions will be asked at the end of the presentation. If you have technical issues, such as no audio or visuals, please try logging off and back on as that solves most issues. And with that, I will turn it over to Jeff to introduce our speaker. Hey, thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone to this seminar series on input output models, uh, which is organized by NOAA's Performance Risk and Social Science Office and by the NOAA Central Library. Thank you very much to Katie from the library and to Jennifer Zhuang from the uh, PERSO team, that's Performance Risk and Social Science Office, for making these seminars possible. Uh, Input-output models show a comprehensive picture of the inner workings of the economy and uh, look at relationships between different sectors of the economy. The seminars in this series will provide the opportunity for NOAA social scientists and policy analysts to learn about the concepts, available models, best practices, and challenges of input-output models. Today's seminar, which is the first seminar in this series, will offer an overview of the Bureau of Economic Analysis, BEA, supply use tables, which are the building blocks of input-output models. It will also introduce the Regional Input-Output Modeling System, or RIMS, which can be used to study how a new project, for example, the development of new infrastructure or the expansion of a marine protected area, can impact the activity of the different economic sectors of a region and lead to changes in employment. The other seminars in this series will be on August 26th. A BEA will present its satellite accounting and the marine economy satellite accounts October, October 20th. Uh, there will be a presentation on, on the use of implant modeling system uh, for fisheries analysis. On October 28th, there will be a um, presentation on model concepts and, uh, so, sorry, on um, input output modeling concepts and the social account model. And uh, now I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, Connor Franks. Connor has been an economist with BEA for five years and specializes in input output accounting. He has worked on a variety of satellite accounts, including the outdoor recreation satellite account, the marine economy satellite account, and the space economy satellite account. His work on the satellite, satellite accounts ranges from research and uh, development of estimates, technical oversight, public outreach, and development of publication materials. Connor, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to speak at this seminar series, and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, so, as mentioned, my name is Connor Franks, and I'm an economist with the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Um, so, this first section of this seminar is going to cover an overview of the supply use tables, and then we'll talk a little bit about their applications. Um, so, when I talk applications, I'm going to be specifically talking about what BEA refers to as our requirements tables, and I'll also touch on the Regional Input Output Modeling System, or RIMS-2, that is produced by our regional directorate here at the Bureau of Economic Analysis. The second part of this webinar series will talk a little bit about the marine economy satellite account that BEA and NOAA have put together over the last, uh, I guess it is five years at this point. And we'll dive into sort of a stylized walkthrough about how BEA takes its supply use tables and turns those into a satellite account. So we can get a little bit of a sort of under the hood look at how BEA creates a satellite account and all of the various different pieces that go into it. But before we dive into that, we're going to need to have a good understanding of what a supply use table is showing us and how BEA puts those together. 
and then some of the various different applications. So without further ado, I will start at the very beginning. We're going all the way back to Econ 101 here with the circular flow of goods and services. Um, now this might be a fairly basic representation of an economy, but I think it does lend itself well. And sort of the point I would like to, to bring out is that within the circular flow, everything stays within this economy. Everything's kind of flowing around within. And I like to think of supply use tables in the same way. Um, so if something is produced in an economy, it has to be used in the economy. And that's sort of an underlying assumption in a supply use framework. And it's one that really is quite important when we're talking about it. Um, so these are just two sort of stylized examples of a supply and a use table here. And what the supply use tables can offer us is we can start unpacking some of the portions of the circular flow here. So if we wanted to look at this business box or this goods and services flow, we could first go to the supply table, which is going to show what is made and what is imported. And it's also going to give information about who is making it. Um, so on the supply table here, we've got industries on the, the columns and we've got commodities on the rows and the supply table is going to show which industries are producing which commodities. Um, if we wanted to further unpack this business box here, we can look to the intermediate input section of the use table, which is going to show the material components of production. So it's going to also have industries on the columns here and commodities on the rows in the use table. And the intermediate input section is going to show how various different industries are using commodities in their production process. Uh, you can also start to unpack the income and labor components of the circular flow in the value added section of the use table. Um, so that's that green box down here and the value added section of the use table is going to show the capital and labor components of production. So between the intermediate inputs and the value added section of the use table, we should get a full picture of how an industry is consuming its intermediate inputs or the material components of production and how labor and capital are introduced into that production process to produce an industry's output. So when I talk labor and capital, I'm mostly talking, um, the value added section will show things like the compensation of employees. It will also show um, what BEA refers to as gross operating surplus, which is principally a uh, profits measure but also includes consumption of fixed capital or the consumption of capital in the production process of an industry. Um, we can also start to unpack this expenditures flow as well with the use table. And that's going to be in the final demand section over here on the right in blue. Um, so this is going to include things like personal consumption expenditures or PCE, private fixed investments, change in private inventories, exports, and government consumption, and uh, gross investment. And so that's going to show where commodities are flowing to their final users. Um, so that's just a brief overview of sort of the sections of your supply and your use table. Um, like I mentioned with the circular flow, really everything needs to, to sort of add up in a use and supply uh, framework. So really briefly, I'm just gonna walk through in a little bit more detail so we can actually maybe read some of the writing on these tables and, and talk through um, primarily what this big orange diagonal is doing in the middle of the supply table. Um, so this orange diagonal is something we refer to as the, the main diagonal of a supply table. It's where an industry is producing its primary output. Um, so what I mean by primary output, and you can look here, this is the agricultural industry, and its primary output is the agricultural commodity. That being said, we do know that the agricultural industry is also producing some other commodities um, in its production process. Um, one example here is going to be the agricultural industry is almost certainly producing some amount of construction as well. And so that's what we call secondary production, where we have an industry that's producing output that's not its primary output, that's not this one-to-one -one sort of correlation. Um, 
so the, the best way I have to describe, you know, what secondary output is, is typically we call something at BEA secondary output if it has a very different production process from the industry's primary output. For example, uh, there's probably a coffee shop in pretty much every single hospital you go to. That coffee shop is probably run by the hospital and the coffee produced there um, is in hospital receipts that we would get from the economic census. But the production process to produce a cup of coffee and to, you know, do surgery are very different production processes. So we would call that uh, the receipts from that coffee shop in the hospital secondary production, but it would still show up here in the supply table. So you would still have uh, educational and healthcare services producing some food and beverage services because of that coffee shop. So that's, that's secondary production in a nutshell. And it plays into our satellite accounting um, when we go to translate sort of the satellite account into actual estimates. You can get some interesting things happening because of that secondary production. So I just wanted to introduce it here in this first uh, session so we can kind of prime the pump when we get to that discussion later on down the road. Um, and then finally, this is just a, a slightly closer view of the use table. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it, but I just wanted to make the point that we're really utilizing every single component of the use table when we move to satellite accounts. So we're going to start with sort of a bedrock in the final demand section, but then we're also going to 100% use the intermediate input section when we're generating those estimates, as well as the value added section when we're generating the estimates. So we're really pulling in both sides and all components of the supply use framework when we actually produce satellite accounts here at BEA. Okay. So just as a brief recap and to introduce some acronyms so I don't have to say a bunch of long words later on down the road. Um, so we've got the intermediate input section of the use table, uh, which are the goods and services used in the production of an industry's output. The value added section, which can also be thought of as an industry's contribution to gross domestic product or GDP. So when you sum together all of the industry's value added from the use table, you will get nominal GDP for that period. And then you've got the final demand section, uh, which are goods and services purchased for final consumption by individuals, businesses, or government. And we can roughly categorize those final, that final demand section into six main categories. Personal consumption expenditures, or PCE, private fixed investment, or PFI, which is businesses purchasing capital, government consumption expenditures and investment. Uh, for this seminar series, we'll just call that GOV. And then we've got inventories, exports, and imports. Um, so just as a, a quick recap of what we covered there. Um, so now what we're gonna do to kind of drive home this point that the supply use framework is this self-contained um, sort of set of estimates, and that really the supply and the use are only work together, we're going to follow through a single commodity, and we're gonna see where that commodity is produced in the United States or imported, and then we're going to follow that commodity through the use table so we can see where it flows to within the economy for this time period. So we're going to follow this agricultural, uh, forestry, fishing, and hunting commodity. I'm just gonna call that agricultural commodity for short to save myself some time. And the first thing we can see is that that is primarily produced about $441 billion worth of agricultural commodity was produced by the agricultural industry. Again, that's totally expected because that's the agricultural industry's primary um, production or primary product. But we can also see if we follow that it's produced by a few other industries here. We've got some wholesale trade industry and retail trade transportation and warehousing and government are all also producing the agricultural commodity. And that gives us a total commodity output of about 447 billion for this time period. Now, when I say total commodity output, what that means in the context of a supply table is that's the domestic production of this commodity in basic prices. So we haven't yet accounted for the trade and transportation margins or the taxes on products or, or any subsidies that the government might provide 
for the agricultural commodity. So right now we've just got $447 billion worth of basic domestic production. We can then go ahead and add in imports. So the United States is importing some agricultural commodities as well. And we get about $506 billion once we've done that. And that's total product supply still in basic prices. So that's the total amount of the agricultural co commodity that's available in the United States during this time period. Um, so the final thing we get to here in this supply table is what I like to refer to as the margin bridge section, which takes this $506 billion worth of agricultural commodity and applies the various different trade and transportation margins, the taxes on products, less uh, subsidies, and gets you the total product supply in purchaser prices or what people would actually pay for these agricultural commodities. Uh, which gets us to $662 billion for this time period of agricultural commodity that's available to be used throughout the United States uh, economy. So we can also look at a supply table in the industry dimension as well. So across the rows here, we're in the commodity dimension. But if we want to look across the columns or down the columns, we can look in the industry dimension and we can see that the agricultural industry produced about $445 billion worth of output. Um, so like we talked about earlier, much of that was the agricultural commodity. We also see that the agricultural industry is doing some secondary production and construction, manufacturing and arts, entertainment, recreation and accommodation um, to give us a total of about that $445 billion. So we've got the industry output and the commodity output of the agricultural uh, industry and commodity respectively there from the supply table. We can now see how this flows throughout the economy and we can see what this industry output is sort of composed of in terms of intermediate inputs and value added. So let's start again with our agricultural commodity. And we're going to see where that is flowing to within the economy. And so the big thing that jumps out to me here, um, and not just because I highlighted it in red, is this $317 billion worth of uh, the agricultural commodity that's being purchased by the manufacturing industry as an intermediate input. Um, one thing I should note before I go too farther, this is sort of a truncated um, use table just to make sure that it would fit on the screen so everybody could see it. Um, so we're missing the rest of the intermediate input uh, commodities here. So we've just got the agricultural intermediates and final demand and then the value added section down here. <clears throat> um, but so we've got manufacturing purchasing $317 billion worth of uh, agricultural commodity. Um, and that makes perfect sense because we know that uh, the manufacturing industry is responsible for taking a lot of those raw goods and uh, materials that are produced in the United States and turning them into something, manufacturing them into something. So uh, that makes perfect sense to me that that would be the largest purchaser of the agricultural commodity. Um, but we do see that pretty much every single other industry in this table, except for utilities, is purchasing some level of the agricultural commodity here. Um, and so the total intermediate purchases is about $449 billion worth of the agricultural commodity was purchased by industries as intermediate inputs to their production process. Um, and finally, we can see the uh, total use of products. Once we switch over here to the final demand section, we can see that the agricultural commodity was purchased in PCE or personal consumption expenditures. We exported some of it and then the uh, change in private inventories. So we actually reduced inventories of the agricultural commodity for this time period. And that gives us a total use of products of about $662 billion, which is exactly the total product supply within that time period. So that is, as I've been sort of alluding to, or maybe more than alluding to as we've gone through this, a fundamental accounting identity within the supply use framework. If something is supplied in a given time period, it needs to be used somewhere across the use table in a given time period. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be used actively. For example, we've got change in private inventories within the final demand section. So it could be that it was purchased and then placed into inventories, but it 
must be used somewhere. So we have to have this supply equals use on the commodity dimension within the supply use framework. Uh, next, we can also follow through the agricultural industry within the use table. And we can see that the agricultural industry consumed $266 billion worth of intermediate inputs in the production of their output. And it also generated about $178 billion worth of value added um, in the production of its process. And that equals about $445 billion worth of industry output, which is exactly the same as the industry supply that we found in the supply table. So that's another fundamental accounting identity uh, within the supply use tables. It's that intermediate inputs plus value added has to equal gross output. And that said a different way, gross output less intermediate inputs is equal to value added. Now that identity, GO less II equals VA, is going to become very important when we start talking about satellite accounts and very important when we talk really for any supply use tables when we go to try to deflate things. Um, so not to get too far into it, but it's very hard to deflate compensation or gross operating surplus because there's not really a price index for profits or somebody's pay. And so to try and get deflated estimates, BEA does what we call a double deflation, where we deflate gross output, we deflate intermediate inputs, and using that same accounting identity, you get deflated value added out of it. So we'll go in more detail in the next session there. But again, just wanted to sort of introduce that concept while we're talking at a national scale. Um, so it'll make sense when we zoom in on these satellite accounts. So just to drive the point home a little bit further, we can see that total industry supply, if you sum up all of the industries here, is going to be equal to total industry output in the use table. And then the same goes for total commodity supply and total commodity use. So you don't need to read everything in this table. It's just here um, as sort of an example of some of the source data that we use. What I'd like to talk a little bit about is the benchmarking process that BEA does to create the supply use tables. So that process is that the supply use tables at their core, um, the supply use tables at their core are built upon the economic census, which occurs every five years um, out of the Census Bureau. And the economic census is a very detailed look at the what industries are producing what products. It's the most level of detail that we ever get. Um, and it's, it's supposed to be a complete population of the um, production happening in the United States at any given point in time. And so BEA uses the economic census once every five years to set a best level of output for the industries. So we can see which industries are producing which commodities, how that's changed over the last five years, and any structural differences will be incorporated. And we go ahead and set a pillar um, that is going to be once every five years. So our last pillar that we set was for the 2012 benchmark using the 2012 economic census. We're currently actively working with the newly released 2017 economic census data to set that 2017 pillar. But the issue arises is that we don't have that depth of data every um, year. So we still want to produce estimates every year. Um, so what we're going to do there is we're going to use primarily uh, census and BLS source data to sort of extrapolate that best level that we set in our pillar year forward until we can get to another economic census year. So this is just an example of some of the source data that we use. Uh, to do that in sort of non-benchmark years. I'm not going to go through it in any detail at all, but suffice it to say that we primarily use census data and other government uh, organizational data. In some cases, we do have to use private data to fill in the gaps, um, but for the most part, we're using the uh, government data here to, to produce our estimates year to year. And then we, when we get that economic census data, we're able to get that very detailed look about what's going on. And that's really what uh, the supply use tables rest on, because it's all about getting the most accurate picture and the most detail possible of who is producing what and who is consuming what. 
within the economy. Um, so we're going to flip over to talking a little bit now that we've got sort of a foundation of what supply use tables are and how to use them. We're going to flip over to talking a little bit about some maybe extensions of the supply use table, if you want to use that terminology. And we're going to talk specifically about the total requirements tables. So in broad terms, total requirements tables show the relationship between final uses and gross output. And so we'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that later on. But for now, let's just talk about the various different types of total requirements tables. So one type of total requirements tables is a commodity by commodity total requirements tables. This is sort of the easiest to get to with the math, but conceptually it doesn't make as much sense as some of the others. So in the commodity by commodity total requirements tables, final demand is shown in terms of commodities, and we're deriving the commodity output that is required to meet that final demand. The next one is the industry by commodity. So for that, final demand is still shown in terms of commodities, but instead of deriving the commodity output that's required to meet that um, final demand, we're deriving the industry output that is required to meet that final demand. And then finally, we have industry by industry, where final demand is shown in terms of industries, and the objective is, again, to derive the industry output that is required. So I'm primarily going to focus on the industry by commodity total requirements table. Now this is a little twofold. One, I think for the industry by industry, final demand is shown in terms of industries. And it's a little bit difficult to conceptualize what final demand means in terms of industry output. Um, for example, when I think of final demand, I think of going out and buying a cell phone, which is a commodity. I don't think about going out and buying a portion of an industry's output. I don't think about going out and buying some portion of cell phone manufacturing's output. So it's a little bit harder to conceptualize what industry final demand is. And then commodity by commodity um, is a little less practical than our industry by commodity. Um, for example, industry by commodity, final demand is shown for commodities, which is easy to conceptualize. And then we derive the industry output that's required to meet that final demand. And what I mean by practical is if you're trying to say, what would be the ramifications of an increase of $100 million of cell phone demand, it's a little bit easier to think in terms of industry output because we also have things like employment and wages in terms of industries, which we don't have in commodities. So if I wanted to know the economic impact of an increase of final demand, it's easier to think in terms of industry output that's required to meet that final demand, because that also easily links us over to employment and wage data, which are things that are really concrete and can be practically talked about. Whereas if we're just thinking about the commodity output that's required, well, we're not really sure which industries are producing those commodities. So it's harder to talk about real world uh, effects when we're in a commodity by commodity total requirements framework. Um, so that's a brief overview of the, the three different types. I'm going to highlight the industry by commodity. And we can talk a little bit about how we put these together and what an industry by commodity total requirements table is actually showing us. Um, so there's two major building blocks I want to make sure we understand what they are. And that's the market share matrix and the direct requirements matrix. So the market share matrix is derived from the supply table or the make table, depending on your framework. And it's going to show which industries are uh, producing which commodities. But instead of showing it in dollar values, it's going to show it in proportion values. So the way that you derive that is you take an industry's uh, output of a certain commodity and divide that by total commodity output for that commodity. And that's going to get you this proportion of how production of a commodity is distributed out through the commodity, or through the industry, uh, economy, excuse me. And then you have your direct requirements matrix. So the direct requirements matrix is going to show one step down the supply chain what are the inputs necessary for an industry to produce its um, output? 
So that is derived from the use table, specifically the intermediate input section of the use table. And it's going to be derived by dividing an industry's use of a commodity by its total output. So it's going to show you the proportion of a commodity to an industry's total output. Um, so for example, things that you could find in a direct requirement matrix would be, say, if you were producing a car, if you were looking at the car manufacturing industry, you would see that it requires, you know, tires, engine parts, paint, leather, et cetera, all of the sort of first step down the, down the supply chain of the production of a car. But that's where it's going to stop. Um, so we don't really need to talk necessarily about the identity matrix. Um, the column vector of final demand by commodity is just taken directly from the use table. And we see we have sort of the calculation. Once we have all of these different building blocks, we can put them all together and get the calculation for total requirements. Um, so something I find slightly interesting, and you, you can look at this calculation in two parts. The first part here, this I minus BD inverse, or the identity matrix, which is just a matrix of ones on the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else, left the direct requirements matrix times the market share matrix, and then you take the inverse of that, that is commodity by commodity total requirements. So if we remove the D and just left everything else, that would be how we calculate commodity by commodity total requirements. We introduce this market share matrix in here to reintroduce the industry by commodity, because essentially what the market share matrix is showing us is where the commodities are produced. And so by reintroducing this market share matrix to a commodity by commodity total requirement, we can say, okay, we've got commodity by commodity, but where are those commodities being produced? And that reintroduces the industry portion and turns this into an industry by commodity total requirements. Um, so that's probably more calculations than anybody wanted to hear. So we'll switch over to some examples of what total requirements look like. Um, so there's a few things I want to hit on here on this chart. Um, so the first thing I want to say is that this is not real data. This should be fairly close to what you would find um, on BEA's website, but it's all just sort of stylized. So the first thing we want to look at is that we've got industries on the row now, and we've got commodities on the columns. So that's a slight difference from the supply table and the use table that we looked at earlier. And so if we sum down the row here, so let's look at this agricultural, agricultural mining and construction column. If you sum down the row, we get $1.88. So what that is telling me is that to get $1 worth of agricultural mining and construction commodity output, you need $1.88 of industry output. And that $1.88 is spread across the, a variety of different industries here. Primarily, that's coming from the agricultural mining and construction industry. But we are also got some other ones going on here, too. Another thing that I would like to note is that on this main diagonal, these will typically be larger than one. Um, and these down here will always be larger than one. And the reason that the, the sums down the columns will always be larger than one is because that total industry output is inclusive of the $1 that is the increase in commodity output here. So we're saying you need $1.88 worth of output to create $1 worth of agriculture, mining, and construction. Of that $1.88, $1 of it is the direct effect, the direct increase in commodity output, and $0.88 cents worth of it is the indirect effect. Uh, which is the, you know, induced demand that needed to happen or the induced output, I should say, that needed to happen to generate that $1 worth of output. Um, so we refer to the column sums as sort of backward linkages where they're linking an increase in final demand or an increase in commodity output to industry output. We refer to, if we had them here, the row sums as forward linkages, where we're saying an increase in industry output will generate this amount of increased demand. Primarily, most of the, of the uh, economic impact models that I'm aware of 
are concerned with these backward linkages. They're trying to see what an increase or a decrease or just a change in final demand would do to industry output. That's primarily the ones that I'm sure that there's some models that look at forward linkages, but the, the, the majority that I'm aware of look at backward linkages. So we've covered this briefly, but just sort of to recap, um, there's a variety of different things you can do with total requirements, um, but you can use, they can be used to analyze linkages between final demand and output. Um, but they can also be used to analyze which commodities are contributing to the production of commodities or industries. Um, and you can do it with a little bit more detail because total requirements are looking at the, um, the full supply chain. Whereas the use table, you really only get one step down the supply chain to see which intermediate inputs are directly contributing to the production process of an industry. The total requirements are going to show you all of the intermediate inputs that are required to produce industry output or required to produce commodity output. Um, so one thing we talk a lot about in the marine economy satellite account is this idea of blue tech, which we think is typically an input into a lot of different inputs in the marine economy. And so a total requirements could possibly show in a little bit more detail how blue tech commodities are being used in the production process of marine industries and we could help trace some of the indirect effects of blue tech uh, with a little bit better or, or more accurate detail. Um, so let's do some actual numbers and see how we could actually use a total requirement and what an impact analysis would really look like using BEA's total requirements models. And this is fairly bare bones. This is a totally stylized example. Um, so in this economy, we only have uh, two industries and two commodities. We've got an industry by commodity total requirements table. So industries are over here on the rows and commodities are over here on the columns. And we're going to trace through an increase in the final demand of goods of $180 million. And we're gonna see both the direct and indirect effects that that $180 million will, will occur. So the first thing, is we look and see how much goods output is going to need to increase. So we can use our total requirements and we can say what this is showing me here is that for every dollar worth of goods output, we need a dollar seventy-five roughly, a dollar seventy-four worth of goods industry output. And we need 44 cents worth of services industry output to get one dollar worth of goods. So this 180 million is going to be multiplied by this one point, that should be 174, to get $313 million worth of goods output. It's generated, that it's necessary, not even just generated, necessary to provide $180 million worth of final demand of goods. But we also get, even though services, the final demand of services is not increased, we also know that there's about for every dollar worth of goods, there's 44 cents worth of services industry output that needs to be generated. And so we get that same calculation here, but with 44 cents here. And we get $79 million worth of services output that is generated uh, based on a final demand increase of goods of 188 million. So one thing to note here is this $313 million worth of goods output is inclusive of this 180 million. So 180 million is sort of the direct effects of 180 million dollars worth of final demand being, you know, in, an increase of final demand of 180 million dollars. That's the direct effect. We know that's produced. But the 100 and, I guess that's 33, is that right? Yeah, 133 million dollars worth of indirect effects were also produced of goods output. And then another $79 million worth of indirect services output was induced by this $180 million worth of uh, goods. And so if we put those together, we get a total increase in output of $392 million, 212 of which was the indirect effects that we got from the total requirements. Um, so briefly, I'm going to go over the RIMS model that BB, uh, BEA prepares. Um, so RIMS is a fee-based model that's used by governments, businesses, and various different policy-making uh, institutions 
to track the impacts of a, an increase in something, a change in a region, and to see how that's going to increase either output, value added, earnings, or jobs impact, depending on which multipliers are chosen. Um, so specifically, this is a regional model. Um, so it covers either states or counties, and they have down to about 372 detailed industries or 63 aggregated industries, I believe. Um, and you, so we'll talk a little bit about, so um, the RIMS model primarily sits upon BEA's national supply use tables. So what the RIMS model does is it takes those interrelationships that are detailed within the supply use framework and regionalizes some aspects of it to ensure that they're not getting regional leakages and that they're covering just the region and leverages those relationships that are in the supply use tables to create some multipliers to show how a particular project or how an increase in demand in one region is going to increase output within that region. Um, so the sources are this 2012 U.S. benchmark input output data, which as we discussed earlier, is primarily sitting upon the economic census data. And then the regional data is how they kind of use the regional relationships that they can see to sort of regionalize um, the input output data within BEA supply use tables. They also use data on commuting in order to see which people are sort of leaving the region and which, how many people are leaving the region for work or staying within the region for work or coming to the region for work. You, you can extrapolate from there. Um, and then some agri census of agriculture and BEA import data. So one thing to note is that the RIMS model is um, adjusted for imports. So it's just looking at domestic output or domestic value added that would increase based on whatever scenario you choose to use in the RIMS model. Um, so again, we've talked a little bit about this, but the methodology behind it is to use these requirements tables that we just discussed. Um, and specifically, the RIMS model is a backward looking model where they're saying there's an increase in final demand or there's a change in final demand. And they're trying to see how that's going to affect industry output within a region. So then they use their regional um, data to adjust for regional leakages, leakages, excuse me. So what I mean by regional leakages is that just because production is happening within a region doesn't necessarily mean that the intermediate inputs for that production are coming from that region. For example, you might have a furniture manufacturer within a region that is outsourcing its um, you know, purchase of wood to a county over. And so that would be a regional leakage where you wouldn't actually get any increase in output for an increase in fan, uh, excuse me, furniture manufacturing because all of our primar the primary input to that furniture manufacturing is coming from a different region. You know, it's coming from one state over. So you wouldn't get that big of an increase in output um, if that occurred. And so one thing to note is that we're treating households as endogenous within the RIMS model as well. Um, so that's a brief overview of the RIMS model. I am by no means an expert in the, that model. I, if we do have specific questions about how that works, I can try my, my best to answer anything that I can, but I can also put you in touch with people who do know quite a bit more about what's going on sort of behind the scenes with the RIMS model. Um, but I, there are also some common misconceptions uh, about how the RIMS model is used. Um, so this first one, using total sales rather than margins for retailer wholesale trade. Um, so this would be an example of where if you were trying to see what the economic impact putting in a new, say, super, Walmart super center within a region would be, you don't want to use Walmart's total sales as a proxy for the increase there. You would actually just want to use the, the margin value, which is the difference between their sales and what they paid for the goods that they're selling. Um, so another one that I wanted to highlight uh, is... Using multipliers for a short-term event um, with the final demand change large enough to change the structure of a regional economy. So this is using RIMS for, say, modeling what would happen to the economic impacts 
or what would happen to the economy after uh, a hurricane hit and just, you know, devastated an area. Um, so you can't really do that because RIMS is sitting on these sort of national um, or regional uh, in the RIMS model, regional input output relationships that existed prior to that short term event. So you'd be using the RIMS model to see how a decrease in demand would flow through the economy on an economy that might look drastically different after it was hit by a hurricane. So if there's a large enough event that it changes the very structure of a regional economy, you're not going to be able to use the past structure to see how that's going to affect the economy. So that's, that's a question that I think we get a lot um, if, if we can use RIMS for that. Um, and so the, that pretty well covers what I wanted to talk about uh, with RIMS and just in general. So I'm going to turn the floor back over to some questions and see if we have any questions that I could help answer. Great, thank you so much, Connor. Um, yes, just a reminder, if you do have a question, please put that into the question panel. It should be on your sidebar there, or you can put it in the chat. I'm not currently seeing any questions, so I'm gonna um, ask Jeff if he has anything he'd like to add. Thanks, Katie. And Connor, thanks for, very much for that very interesting and uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, just had a quick question that I know um, several people uh, in NOAA um, are thinking of, and that is uh, using a model such as RIMS uh, versus other um, models that are uh, common and commonly used, uh, such as Implant or REMI. When, in general, uh, would it be appropriate to use uh, RIMS and not use the other models or use one of the others and, and not uh, RIPS. Thank you. Sure. So I can't speak too much about other models. I can say one thing that is a benefit is I have ran into implant models in the past uh, that were using, say, BEA's 2002 benchmark data as their basis and hadn't been updated in a long time. And so I think that's where you can start to run into some issues. And I think one of the benefits that we can introduce with RIMS is that it is going, since it is produced by BEA, you get that assurance that we're updating it as frequently as possible. Um, so I think there, there, I guess I'll say not all implant models are made equal. And so when making that decision, I think you definitely need to look and see what the basis of an implant model is um, before kind of pulling the trigger on that. Um, and then also, I think the, the regional aspect of RIMS is something that not all implant models can offer, um, though I'm, I'm sure that they, they absolutely can in, in some instances. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. We have a few questions that came in. Our first question is, what are the offsets? Uh, one second here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can get to some notes. Are we not seeing my screen? We are not seeing your screen. Okay, so the offsets into consideration um, are talking, speaking specifically towards where the event in question that is being analyzed by the RIMS model is causing some decreases elsewhere. Um, so for example, if you have, say, a, uh, we'll stick with the Walmart Supercenter coming in. If you just look at the increase in output that the Walmart Supercenter is going to bring into a, a region, you're probably not also going to take into account that some smaller grocery stores or specialty shops might be going out of business or getting less business because of that uh, economic change from the Walmart Supercenter. So I think when we're talking about some of these common misconceptions, we're talking about you need to definitely tailor the economic change and, and take everything into account when we're doing these RIMS models. Because if you're not, you're going to have increased um, impacts that, that might not actually play out in the real world. 
Thanks, Connor. I just want to make sure we can get your uh, slides, your slides back on uh, in your sharing uh, and the sharing options. Can you uh, see that your screen is showing on the GoToWebinar control panel? There we go. We've got your notes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Your slides are back up. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm going to move on to our next question. Do you have any suggestions for modeling the impact of a change in commodities output, such as more farm or fisheries production? Sure. Um, so I think that would be probably forward linkages at that point. You know, so we talked a lot about backward linkages where we're talking about, uh, you know, what would an increase in demand do? But if we're just talking about an increase in um, industry output there, you know, the, the production of agricultural um, you know, fishery output is sort of an industry output, that would be a forward linkages. So you could use, you know, BEA's total requirements, and we can click back over here. Um, so we're looking at this agricultural mining and construction. Um, so we do have information on what would happen. You know, we talk we talked a little bit about these row sums here. Um, I think that would be an interesting place to start, um, primarily because they're free uh, on the internet um, and gives you a, a very interesting, we have it at much more detail than this, and it can give you an interesting look or a starting point there um, using BEA's total requirements. Um, and you'd be primarily concerned with sort of what would happen to commodity output. You know, what would commodity output increase with an increase in production within this industry? Great. Thank you. Our another question. Uh, could you please explain a little more on the last bullet of the misconception slide? For example, what if the study area consists of two counties? Sure. Yeah. So RIMS is just a single region. Um, I do believe that they can create a region out of various different counties. Um, so that that is not a problem. The problem lies in when you want to sort of compare two different things. You want to see how two different counties are going to increase with the same uh, economic change. And so we can sort of and again, I, I, this is my belief, but we can talk more about RIMS offline um, and I can connect with people who are a little bit more knowledgeable. But my understanding is that you can sort of tailor fit a region, but it's just that region you're looking at. You're not going to be able to look at multiple regions with the same RIMS model. Um, so you kind of need to say this, it's these counties, yes, but that sets your region. And once you've set that region, it's that going forward. Great, thank you. Um, this question was an partially answered earlier, but if you wanted to elaborate on that, that would be fine. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of REMS2 over, say, REMI or IMPLAN? Yeah, I don't think I have too much to, to expand. I, I can't speak too much to, to models that I don't uh, have intimate information about like like Remy or in plan so it's hard to make comparisons there okay great thank you uh, that is the end of my questions right now unless someone is furiously typing so we'll give everyone another 30 seconds and in the meantime jeff could you highlight when the that next seminar is again sure. Katie, can i ask another question to Connor? oh yeah go ahead and that's uh, regarding um the multiplier uh, the um, employment and multiplier, basically the creation of jobs uh, from a certain investment or project. Um, and my question is if, uh, if these models take into account the, num the possible jobs that are taking, taken away from other industries to supply, for example, uh, new jobs created in, in, the, in this project. Sure. Um, so that sort of depends on a few things. So that's a little bit what I was talking about with those offsets, um, where that's a little bit on the, the, the person setting up the RIMS model or the, the client 
uh, of DEA to take into account what the some of the effects would have um, on an economic impact. And then if you start getting too far into a structural change, that's what this bullet point here is really speaking to, where if you've totally changed the, the structure of a regional economy with a change, then RIMS can't really handle that because we're using those interrelationships within the region that have already kind of been set. And so if there's this, this very dramatic change, it's not going to necessarily handle it. Now, that being said, that most economic changes aren't going to be changing the structure of a regional economy so dramatically that it's going to, to fall to that point. Um, you know, that's usually we talk about that in terms of, say, natural disasters that are going to do that. Um, but I think I think there is there is an aspect, but it needs to be in those offsets where we talk about, OK, we know that there's going to be this increase in employment. And we also think that there's going to be a decrease in, say, maybe industry output here. And that would then filter in for the, the decreases in employment that that decrease in industry output would, uh, would bring to the table. Thank you, Connor. Katie, the next uh, seminar in the series is on August 26th, and that's on BA satellite accounting and the marine economy satellite accounts. Great. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks, Connor. I do not have any more questions, so we can give everyone back a couple minutes of their day. I look forward to seeing everyone on Thursday for the follow-up to this presentation. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. If you missed it or if you'd like to pass this on to a colleague, uh, the library has recorded it and we will be posting it up on our YouTube channel. And uh, I let I put that link into the chat. Thank you all and have a great day.